I'm uh, trained as a biophysicist and MR imaging is my major interest there and as a neurologist my main clinical and research interest is multiple sclerosis, a disease that obviously has neuroinflammation and a high percentage of uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, also interested in uh, Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury that have their inflammatory components. The um, major professional organization for me is the American Academy of Neurology and every year one of the major prestigious awards that's given at that meeting is the S. Ware Mitchell Award, and many of you may know that S. Ware Mitchell was a physician in the Civil War and wrote seminal papers on causalgia, neuropathic pain due to traumatic nerve injury from low-velocity musket balls in those days. So I think I have a, a connection to many of the things that you're talking about today, um, and I'm happy to be here. Aaron asked me to uh, give you a little overview of the kind of resources and infrastructure that we have at UNM that might provide a focal point or connections for collaborative work that might involve anybody in the room uh, at, in collaborations with the university uh, researchers. I'm not going to dwell on some of these slides that you've seen, but our program in brain and behavioral health uh, is connected intimately with the Clinical and Translational Science Center, which is our biggest umbrella. And as Richard pointed out, and I won't spend much time here either, that we are one of the six signature programs, which makes us more special than the others is that last year our chancellor singled us out for uh, development and has targeted the Brain and Behavioral Health signature program to be transformed into the Brain and Behavioral Health Institute. And we are in the process of working through a strategic plan and trying to determine what that is when you're uh, bringing together a group of uh, individuals that obviously uh, have a lot of different departments and research interests and clinical interests uh, under this uh, umbrella of a Brain and Behavioral Health Institute. Um, so we have our homes. We have part of the CTSC building actually is being renovated and will be open up in December for housing neurology neurosurgery clinics. And... Uh, that's, that's a welcome new addition that puts two clinical programs uh, together. We have uh, a building we call the Neurobiology, which is uh, an addition to an existing facility that has created a very uh, unique, I think, and very comprehensive integrated translational research facility. The original piece of it in 1985 housed the, uh, the institution's original uh, MRI scanner. Uh, that still exists, uh, although the scanner fortunately has been upgraded. Then the building was added onto, and the Mind Research uh, Institute, Mind Research Network, uh, has a facility there, and they operate a 3T magnet and an MEG. And uh, Vince, I think, will be talking to you uh, a bit about the research that's available with that. Uh, we added this neurobiology additions, which is some dry lab space for clinical trials. And on the back side of the building is another piece of that building which is a series of wet lab benches for doing a basic bench type of research. Also associated with it is a COBRE-funded brain research, uh, brain imaging center, which is an animal imaging facility that has animal MRI, and I'll, I'll show you some of the other equipment there, but includes electron paramagnetic resonance. And then the old part of the building is a clinic, and so we actually have our uh, some of our neurology clinics, like my MS clinics and others. So we, in a sense, patients can come in and be seen, be diagnosed, be treated, move into clinical trials, clinical research studies on any of the equipment that's there. The animal work can be translated uh, directly into human studies on equipment that's similar, uh, for example, the MRI. So it's a, it's a very uh, interesting facility if you get a chance to go see it. So the vision of our Brain and Behavioral Health Institute is to become the leading center in this mountain west region. You've seen how sparse it is for uh, research uh, in, uh, efforts like the trans, uh, CTSCs in research, clinical care, and training to better understand and diagnose and treat neurological and behavioral health disorders. We, we do involve psychiatry. Why would anybody need a Brain and Behavioral Health Institute? This is a, a list of the kinds of diseases and problems that affect our population. They surely uh, affect yours. 10% you know, of our admissions are due to traumatic brain injury. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a leading cause of death, the eighth leading cause of death. 50% of us will have that by 85 unless we do something about that. Drug addictions, neuropsychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, neurodevelopmental disorders, and uh, 
genetic disorders, cavernous malformations are endemic in New Mexico. We actually have a founder gene group here uh, for cavernous malformations uh, that we study. And this is a list of the programs, departments in the School of Medicine that are part of our brain and behavioral health. It's not just departments that have neuro in the name or psychiatry in the name, obviously. So there are people uh, in faculty and family and community medicine or pediatrics or OB um, pathology who have interests in different brain disorders or psychiatric disorders and the College of Pharmacy we work with. So how do we get people together? Uh, you heard some ideas for the madness retreat and other methods for bringing people into a room. It's the long-standing problem. Everybody's successful. You, they're at the institution because they are successful they're in their own work. They're, they have their sphere of influence in their silo. How do you get them out of that? What, what makes them want to cross a boundary, work with somebody in a program or a department uh, or a school that they've never worked with before, and how do you leverage that? So uh, we took a creative approach to that. I thought we we called it the Imaging Connectivity Retreat, and Aaron was there, and, and some of the other people, uh, maybe Vince, I think you were there. Uh, so we invited 50 scientists, and they were not just from the Health Sciences Center, but we had people from neurology and neurosurgery and the basic sciences, neuro, neurosciences, and radiology, pathology, biochemistry. We also had main campus uh, participants from the School of Engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, people from the Mind Research Network who do the... MR imaging, the data analysis, the MEG, magnetoencephalography work. And we also had some of our colleagues uh, from our national labs. We're uh, fortunate in New Mexico to actually have two national labs, Sandia National Labs and Los Alamos, both of which have uh, very high levels of expertise in a lot of areas that have direct application to biomedical kinds of research. So 50 of these people came, and before, let me move that back up, before they came, we asked them to make a quad chart for us. Uh, this is how we decided to do this. Uh, uh, the quad charts are pretty common in the military. Uh, they're used at Sandia National Labs. You just take a one sheet of paper, divide it into four sections. And in one section, you uh, describe a clinical problem, if you're a clinician, or a technology or an analytic capability that you have if you're not. And in the next quadrant, you write a statement of what you know, the questions that you need to answer, or, if you're a technology, what you can measure or model. And then the third uh, section would be a summary of the benefits that might develop if you were able to get a deliverable on those questions. And the fourth would be an estimate of the kind of resources you might need, collaborations, partners, people, equipment, what would you need to try to make an initial um, foray into that area. So a small group got together and we took these quad charts and we deliberately mixed people up so that they were not in groups that they would normally associate with. So we'd have maybe in a group of six or eight, two clinicians, uh, two basic scientists, uh, two technical experts in, say, MEG or microelectric mechanical systems, uh, maybe some data analytic people uh, who do uh, connectivity analysis or, or other kinds of network analyses and modeling. And then we put them at a table, and each participant would spend a few minutes, hopefully no more than five, telling the rest of the group about his quad chart and what he does, what his expertise is, or what his question and problem is in the in a disease-related area, and then they would spend time brainstorming. So how could we, who have never heard this before, and of course you ask questions and learn more about the specifics of the people who are there with you, what could we do together that might address these questions that you raised? And it was pretty amazing how uh, innovative and novel some of the ideas were. And at the end of the day, everybody bubbled those up on um, uh, sheets that they had written them down on and presented them to the general group. Other people could then uh, look at that and put their name on it and, and sign on to them. And then uh, we try to follow up with those groups, get them to meet again, try to push and uh, facilitate the development of uh, developing a pilot study that maybe we have some pilot funding to help support or can some way help launch into a new area of research. In a sense, creating a new research team, a group of uh, scientists that have never worked together before. So... Just quickly, this is what a quad chart would look like. This is one that I filled out in MS. Um, you know, MS uh, demyelinates axons, slows down central conduction. People with MS have cognitive problems. The question was, if, if you do an MEG, you can measure brain activations to a cognitive task. You tell them to 
you put a signal into one visual field or the other and ask them to move one hand or the other, and then depending on how you do that, you might have to transmit information across the corpus callosum. So the, the question is, is that slow? Well, we did the pilot study, and it is. It's 300 milliseconds going across an MS compared to 100 milliseconds in a normal person, which is a huge difference on the MEG. The next question, which we started to answer, is, well, there happens to be an FDA-approved drug called 4-aminopyridine that blocks potassium channels, and when that happens, it restores conduction in demyelinated axons, at least some of them. So some of this conduction ought to be restored, and you might see a difference in conduction time or coherence of the areas that are supposed to be activated in the normal state. So we've done the pre-state, and now we've got somebody who started this particular drug, and we're in the pilot phase of trying to see if, in fact, the drug makes a difference. And that would kind of get at the whole issue of, you know, can you actually measure neuroprotection? Can you measure neural repair? Maybe you could do these kinds of studies in a treatment that might lead to uh, repair of uh, central axons and that type of problem. So just an example of, uh, and I just said that, but one of the examples of one of these projects that's ongoing. And then there are some others that we're hoping will come to fruition and maybe uh, lead to some a real opportunity for a new uh, funding so we also try to obviously use pilot funding. I mean, to the question that was asked, how do you get people to do this? Well, uh, one nice way to do it would be if I, as uh, the person who's supposed to be trying to develop this Brain and Behavioral Health Institute, had something to give them. So I said, if you come work together and play nicely, we have space, we have money, we have equipment, and, but we don't. We don't get that. Just, uh, everybody has to be uh, bought into this because they see some value in working together and doing something together that uh, they wouldn't be able to do by themselves or alone, and they, they see that as valuable. And that's kind of the tricky thing that we're, uh, we're trying to work through and find good strategies for doing that. That said, we do have at least a little bit of pilot funding, and we can target our RFAs to say, if you are working with a group that hasn't worked together before and you have a novel idea, you will get higher score on the, on the uh, evaluation for the pilot funding, and then maybe we get some success that way, and we, we're working on that. So just recently, we partnered with CTSA and the uh, Cobre Brain Center. We pooled some of our pilot funding resources, created an RFA, and funded eight uh, awards for a total of $175,000. Those are ongoing. They have one year to spend the money, and that's important because I don't know how it is in some of your world, but in ours, if the money isn't spent in a year, we can lose it. So we insist that they design a project that they can actually spend the money and do the work. Uh, you wouldn't think that would be hard, but it is. People ask for money and then they don't spend it. <laughs> so some of the projects, uh, titles, or at least the air, brief titles of the uh, programs that we funded this year, delivery of microRNA inhibitors after stroke. This is an in an animal model of stroke. Novel superparamagnetic MRI contrast agents for Alzheimer's disease will be studied in animals and maybe translate directly into humans if it works and is safe. Uh, electron paramagnetic resonance oximetry studies of methamphetamine. Uh, you can measure free radicals with EPR and uh, in vivo oxygenation status in the rat brain. Matrix metalloproteinase inhib inhibition and neuroprotection and remodeling after stroke. So, and then that's in an animal model as well. So these give us at least a chance to get some novel projects going and hopefully some of these turn into funded uh, research. Other things I don't directly work with, but asked people to give me some information that might be of interest to you, and uh, Dr. Nornberg is going to be here tomorrow, and he is the director of the Keck UNM Small Animal Imaging Resource, we call CUSAIR. It has PET, SPECT, and CT Small Animal Imaging, and it's a very powerful facility that can do a lot of things. Uh, this is a list of some of the services that the Keck Center offers here. Uh, PET, SPECT, and CT I mentioned, uh, preclinical in vivo imaging. They can do biodistribution studies because uh, this is within the uh, College of Pharmacy that Dr. Nornberg is a, uh, a PharmD. Pharmacokinetic modeling, tumor models, cellular molecular assays, studying drug effects and pharmacodynamics, dose ranging, toxicities, radiation effects, so a lot of things. The, the equipment that they have includes a, a spec CT and a small animal spec CT, uh, a pet, a lab pet that can do uh, small animal pet imaging. And of course, these can be uh, superimposed on top of CT or in, even small animal uh, imaging at the center I just described so that you can have overlays of uh, high resolution imaging with these spec and pet studies. 
Uh, tissue culture can be done in-house. Uh, there's all the equipment needed for you know, working with radioactive tissues and other radio tracers and counters for biodistribution work and so forth. And these are some examples that uh, Jeff sent me, and I think he's planning to talk to you in somewhat more detail. But you know, these are some examples of, uh, of radio nucleid studies in the rat model, uh, oncology showing renal cell carcinomas lighting up, um, uh, basal ganglia dopamine and 99 technetium uh, lighting up the basal ganglia in the rat model. They have a wide array of radionuclides and tracers, and I don't have a lot of familiar, familiarity with all of these, but you can look down the list for any that might be of interest to you, um, the iodine and the galliums and indiums, you know, radioactive copper and so forth, and the half-life. So all these can be used to label uh, compounds that might label targets of interest from tumors to inflammation uh, to um, whatever you want to study. This is a pretty set of pictures of PET and CT. CT, of course, giving you the nice uh, skeletal imaging of the animal and then the PET uh, tracer lighting up brain. This is uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, so of course it lights up in the brain as well as it's in the kidneys and in the bladder. So bladder I don't think is of much interest to them. The uh, Brain Imaging Center I mentioned is the COBRE Center. Uh, this started out um, uh, as a COBRE and it got a refunded COBRE, so it's now uh, moving on in its development. Uh, it got a P30, I'm sorry, moved from a COBRE to a P30. Uh, they have an electron paramagnetic resonance core. The uh, MRI is a 4.7 T magnet. Optical electrophysiology, cellular and molecular, and an animal surgery core all housed in this 10,000 square foot addition to that complex of uh, buildings I was describing at the beginning. Uh, and the EPR, they have a Bruker system, uh, two Brukers actually, uh, spectrometers that can uh, measure different types of uh, signals from small animals, uh, looking at oximetry, oxygen free radicals, in tissue slices, as well as in whole animals. The MRI core has a 4.7 T, 40 centimeter bore magnet, so you can get animals in there up to pigs. Uh, typically, they're using rats, rabbits, and, and somewhat smaller animals, but it can do all of the important imaging sequences, although it is it's 4.7 T. It's useful, and it can do a lot of things. It works well. It's easy to manage. It's not a 7 T. It's not a 9.4 T, but it is a very useful machine. You can do perfusion studies and diffusion weighted imaging, diffusion tensor, uh, functional imaging, multinuclear spectroscopy. You can do both proton and, and phosphorus, for example. The uh, optical electrophysiology core has arrays for measuring transmembrane potentials with vol voltage sensitive dyes. Uh, you can use uh, interference contrast infrared systems for single cell work. And there's a two-photon laser scanning microscope stationed on, on site there for, as well. The uh, cellular and molecular core uh, is for culture work, histology, fluorescence microscopy. It has a cryostat, fluorescent microscope, tissue culture, and instruments for uh, cellular and molecular biology. And at the same building, right next door to this uh, Cobre Brain Imaging Center, is the Human MR Imaging Center at the Mind Research Network. Um, that facility houses a Siemens 3T research dedicated magnet. It has no uh, clinical imaging load, so all the work that it does is human research at 3T. And it's a, a very nice machine as well that does, uh, obviously, high-resolution state-of-the-art imaging, functional imaging, diffusion, proton spectroscopy, mag transfer, whatever it is that uh, your protocol might need can be uh, programmed in and done. And then the, the, the MRN has a very nice uh, group of people who are experts in image processing data analysis who will, can help you process that data. They, they do a lot of it automatically. They can do very sophisticated segmentations and other calculations, um, independent components analyses, for example, on resting states. And so it's a, it's a very uh, powerful set of tools and, and a great group of people. It sits right there next door to the animal research and the bench research and the clinic and the dry lab space. So we have this under one roof. We have this, I think, uh, 
a place where people, scientists can actually spend time together. They can bump into each other. You can talk to people. You can say, you know, you have a question, you can ask a scientist or a scientist can ask a clinician or if they're doing a scan, I can be there to make sure that the, you know, the scan safety is covered, covered while they're in the magnet and that kind of thing. So uh, we're very fortunate to have that. So just to wrap it up, that's a brief overview. You'll hear more from some of the other speakers, but one of our priorities, you heard it from Richard, our, one of our priorities is translational research. Uh, we, we value, we emphasize basic research. We have strong clinical programs in all the major areas. I, uh, as, as I said, represent the brain and behavioral health part of that, but there are others. And our goal is to bring that research together with the clinical needs and to move that into the, uh, uh, the communities and the populations that need help and make that that continuum of research and translational research that the CTSAs are all about. We have a great synergy between the CTSA, the Brain and Behavioral Health Institute, the Brain Imaging Center, the CUSAIR. We have collaborations with MRN, the National Labs, Los Alamos, Sandia, and our main campus departments of engineering, computer science, and many others. So, uh, people like to collaborate. We just have to give them a, a platform and a, and a way to get together and hopefully sometimes a little bit of uh, incentive or a little bit of support and help, whatever that is, to, to get them to that next stage where they can develop something that's ongoing and self-sustaining. So to me, it's a target-rich environment. There's a lot to do. Uh, we're all about innovative collaboration. That's our goal. And who knows, maybe uh, some of you in the room here will join us and we can form some new partnerships. So thanks for giving me a chance to talk to you. So Dr. Ford, you talked to us about the small animal uh, uh, SPECT uh, pet imaging capabilities. What about the, the clinical uh, opportunities for SPECT and, and PET at, at UNM? Thank you. Yeah, I, I really meant to mention it because I didn't put it on the slide and I was hoping I would remember, but I didn't. Um, but uh, UNM does, is uh, ramping up a PET imager that's human uh, based and it's at the cancer center that it will, where it will get its primary use. I'm, uh, I believe that it will be available for the right kind of other study. So, uh, you know, if needed, uh, it's possible uh, that uh, that would be available. And it's nice because it's going to be associated with a cyclotron uh, run by semen. So we'd be able to make potentially novel new pet tracers. So it's, obviously, it's connected with the tube, you know, so that you can make something that has a short half-life and pipe it really fast into the room with the patient and get it in. So I think the future may involve you know, maybe some compounds that don't have to get through the mail or be sent from uh, Phoenix, uh, you know, in an hour so that it can be used. We may be able to do some very novel things with the combination of PET plus cyclotron on site. Um, so just to connect to that, um, so what we understood from last year's um, workshop on activated glia, uh, we were informed that radio ligands are a real bottleneck in terms of molecular imaging, getting them approved by the FDA. So it would seem that the development of the radio ligands, taking them from preclinical states into clinical research is a, is a key thing that needs to be happening for the advancement of molecular imaging. So is that a, do you see this as a, a, a focus for UNM to help uh, make that transition? Well, yeah, I think we're very interested in the possibility of getting a, a GCP certified lab. Do you want to speak to that, Richard? Uh, so that we can move the drugs in the right way to, uh, through. Recognizing that as a problem. The first is, um, one of the biggest barriers is nobody understands the FDA. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a device pathway and there's a drug pathway. Imaging agents sometimes go both ways. A nanoparticle can go either way. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the imaging agents go the drug route. They're actually easier than a drug down the drug route uh, because you don't have the tox barriers usually. Um, so uh, we have, uh, there's actually, we have a great online FDA training, 23 hours online. You can use it off our web page. Anybody from the outside can use it too. Actually, people have found it very informative of trying to understand the process. That's the first thing. The second thing is the FDA has put in place what they call a pre-IDE or, or pre-IND steps, which are really useful. The earlier you engage the FDA, the better. So I think education is, uh, you can't be afraid of it. 
you got to kind of get in there and duke it out. And so that's the, the first step. Second is we've got regulatory people uh, in place, primarily uh, either through our IRB or through the CTSA, that can help you. Uh, we, one of the online things is even how to fill out the form. Question number one, answer this way. Question number two, answer this way. So, um, so I think that sort of thing is, is your first step. The third thing is really um, to realize that commercial partners here can really, really, really help you out. And one of the key things, and what most small company partnerships don't understand is the importance of an FDA consultant. And so to get a partner who has an FDA consultant is it's worth its weight in gold. And every time I'm involved with those, that sort of situation, I say, why don't we get an FDA consultant? You guys pay for the FDA consultant, and we'll just do everything needed to just push it through. GMP and GLP is a challenge anywhere. If you have to kind of go through that, especially in the, your animal studies. Uh, it's expensive. You typically have to outsource it. Uh, that's the way we do it in our, uh, in our case. We do the basic studies and then outsource it. In some sense, most of the companies fund it. We usually get the corporate partner to fund it, and then it works okay because they're paying the expense anyway. And then we get the data back, and then you can, and they feel good because they validated whatever the investigator did. I think uh, part of the challenge there is to get the investigator to feel good that they're not giving it up, not giving it up by having somebody else do it, and then you still are kind of involved as you go by. And I, I think once. Um, you show an investigator how they always have value added to that process, whether they're actually hands-on on the experiments or not, um, it, it usually works. It's analogous to the process when you're junior faculty, you think you actually have to do the experiment to have value added. You know, By the time you're a senior faculty, you realize, if I actually do the experiment, I don't have any value added. It's, it's kind of in a different arena. So I, I think those are a few of the things we're trying to do. Uh, the FDA is, uh, and you know, the FDA is trying to meet NIH halfway, so at least the IRB requirements overlap and all that sort of stuff. So I hope that, ends. and in, in far as the PET, we're actually renovating our PET right now uh, for Oxygen 15 Bold, which is uh, got a lot of challenging regulatory issues with the Albuquerque Clean Air Board. But it is the gold standard for measuring exactly. brain perfusion. 